So the 6th century, the years 500 to 600, I've already talked about this and you're familiar with it, but just to get ourselves kind of regrouped here, this is the time when we, in general terms, are going to talk about the fall of political Rome. Political Rome had, of course, dominated the landscape for many, many years. The traditional founding of Rome goes clear back to 753 B.C. You have the Roman Republic in 509 B.C. For a thousand years, this great colossal empire had dominated the Mediterranean world and the entire civilized world, as far as we can tell. And now, at this point, around the year 500, a little earlier, we find that this great colossal empire devolves into a huge fragmentation of little uh, kind of private competing interests here and there, more or less under barbarian control. And so this is a great change. It's a huge change that uh, really probably from our point of view is almost impossible to imagine. What a, what a remarkable transformation this would have represented for people who were alive at that time. There's a little nursery rhyme you all know. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. You know that's all about Rome, isn't it? Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses all the king couldn't have put him together again. And that's been at least allegorically applied to Rome and all the attempts down through history to try to reconstruct this great Roman world. Mussolini tried to do it, Napoleon tried to do it, others have tried to do it. Never one, no one has ever really been successful. It was sort of a unique uh, moment of history, that thousand years or so in which Rome was the dominant reality. But uh, in any event, this is the point where uh, Rome is uh, reaching its end. There is a difference, of course, as you know, between East and West. The Eastern Empire does continue. Constantine had moved the capital of Rome from Rome to Byzantium in the year 330, changed the name to Constantinople, and from that point on, we have an ongoing representation of the Roman tradition there in the East, but the West, for its part, simply because in some ways it was now not so much the focus of imperial interest, began to feel the effects of that over time. And so there had been a gradual separation, and when we finally have the fall of Rome taking place, uh, it's really Western Rome that we're thinking of the Western Roman Empire. Rome was sacked, as we mentioned last week, by the Goths, in the year 410, that was a brutal insult to the Roman psyche. It was one thing to have these barbarians affecting the far-flung reaches of the Roman world. It was another thing to have the knife go right into the heart of Rome. And so when the city itself was pillaged, much of it burned, much of it destroyed, and the entire city put to that kind of discomfiture. That, of course, shook the entire Roman world and all of the Roman forces that were sort of flung here and there around the ancient world were called back to defend Rome in particular, Italy in general, and so that contributed to the fact that there was no longer much of a credible ability to keep these vast reaches of territory from falling into barbarian hands. In particular, Britain was abandoned. We noted that last year in, or last week in connection with the story of, of St. Patrick. And so we find that uh, that region and much of the Roman world as well was more, to, more or less left to their own devices. This increasing barbarian pressure led to the collapse of Rome. Usually historians will put the date of 476. Not that anything necessarily all that dramatic happened. This was an ongoing story in which multiple forces were at work, but it's a convenient date and it's been traditionally used as the time when Rome fell. So the Western Empire fragmented completely. The church then for a while was left as more or less the only stabilizing influence. And here the church which had begun so beleaguered and then finally gain legitimacy, now in some ways rises to the position of being the one thing you could depend on. When everything else seemed to be up for grabs, when there was a great deal of instability, it was the church that was there. The church was functioning as much as possible as the school, the hospital, the preserver of learning, all of the things that had been done by the empire now are more or less taken over, although in fits and starts, by the church, and so the church has a new prestige, in a sense, that begins to become visible about this time. This is part of the reason that you begin to hear of church being called Holy Mother, because there is a kind of maternal 
element to the church's role that it begins to play at this point. And this, of course, was a great service that was performed. So I'm saying the rise of ecclesiastical Rome is taking place out of the ashes of the fall of political Rome, and that is the paradigm shift that seems to be occurring here. These unstable and tumultuous times were largely the result of barbarian forces. You're aware of this. There were many of them coming from various parts of the ancient world. And it was the church that in many ways met and produced a kind of stabilizing influence among these tribes that were not only battling with what was left of Rome, but battling with each other. And so the chaotic character of this time in many ways was pacified to some degree by the influence of the church. Now this is more than you ever wanted to know about these guys, but you know, if, if not now, then when? There are, uh, by most people's reckoning, somewhere around 10 of these so-called barbarian tribal groups. I'm not an expert on this, I just want to show you a map and mention some of the ones that are better known, and uh, there will be a test. So just uh, note that. We have the Huns, Attila the Hun, you know that name. He'd been there in the mid-400s. He was one of the major threats to Roman continuity, but the Huns themselves continued. Of course, the nation Hungary was named for them eventually. They come largely from the east and from the north, kind of northeast Russia. You have the Angles and the Saxons. They, of course, come from the east uh, into the region of Britain. And this is taking place in the 500s. By the time we get to 600 and a few years thereafter, they have become a dominant presence in the region of Britain. The Angles and the Saxons are a special interest to us because many of us in this room would descend from Angles and Saxons, you know. And I just want you to know if that any of you have any impression that these were kind of a superior people, then you should go back and join them as they sat around campfires eating raw meat and drinking blood and worshiping sticks and stones, I think it'll, it'll disabuse any of us of some idea that there was anything superior about them. They just, you know, happened to be one more of those kind of vicious tribal groups that were involved way back when. We have the Ostrogoths and other Gothic groups that uh, come largely from the east and from the north, and they, of course, are hard to trace. They don't leave a lot of written records of their activities, but we know that they're showing up. The Burgundians came largely from the east, settled the region that came to be called uh, Burgundy. Uh, the Goths, the Lombards showed up in uh, Spain and especially in Italy, and the Lombard forces were some of the most immediate threats to Rome during the years that we're contemplating right now. The Franks are of interest to you. They had been a Germanic tribe coming from the region that we call Germany, but with the withdrawal of Rome from Gaul, the Franks move in. And so we want to highlight their history just a little bit more in a moment. The Vandals came from the south. They came from North Africa. A lot of these blue lines you see toward the bottom of that map show vandal migrations up through Spain, up through Italy, up through Greece, and they earned their name the hard way. You know, we still talk about vandals, and usually, except unless you're talking about a team from Idaho, we're talking about people that are not very uh, respectable in their treatment of property and people and so on, and that's where that, of course, expression came from, and the Visigoths uh, there as well. So uh, very, very confusing, hard to document this because they themselves didn't leave a lot of records of their activities. They weren't scholarly type people necessarily. They weren't always warrior types either. In many cases, they were migrating simply to get land to farm. They weren't always just engaged in kind of violent, uh, gratuitous uh, sorts of uh, destructive behavior, but nevertheless, that's kind of the memory we have of them, and at least to some degree with good reason. By the time we reach the year 500, the Christian faith had a presence in all the, all the areas that you see there in pink on this map. Is that pink to you? I guess it is, yeah. So all across North Africa, up through uh, the north part of Egypt, the Holy Land, up through most of Turkey, Greece, Italy, Gaul, uh, AKA France, Spain, reaching up there toward uh, the uh, kind of the, the British Channel, and about half of England and Ireland under the influence of St. Patrick, all of that had a very credible Christian presence. So as we reach this first, uh, the end of this first chapter, that would be essentially a picture of the growth of 
of the Christian faith. A lot of work to be done, but nevertheless, for 500 years of labor, this is a pretty respectable showing, and so this is where the church is at this point. What needs to be noted is that not every Christian was on the same page theologically. We've talked about the Arians, and the Arians were especially influential among certain of these barbarian tribes. The Goths, the Lombards, and the Burgundians famously were converted to the Christian faith, but largely to an Arian form of the Christian faith, and that continued to be very important for many years to come. We're going to look in the next uh, two or three weeks at the beginnings of Islam, and at least one, I think, quite credible hypothesis is that Muhammad himself was touched deeply by Aryan Christianity, and that that was, in, in a sense, the imprint that he used to go back to his own native Saudi Arabian regions and start the religion that we know of as, as Islam, with its, with its hardcore monotheistic ideas, largely coming from an Aryan view that uh, we can trace back then to earlier centuries. So I'll save further discussion for that till later, but just make a little mental note of that. So you have the Aryan form of Christianity out there, the Franks, who came in from Germany, were largely untouched by Christian influence. They came from the north. When Rome withdrew from Gaul, they migrated across the border and showed up then in this region that was called Gaul, then we call it France, and the darkest kind of uh, green region there is where they first landed. Now this, you may wonder, why is this important? So trust me, just work with me here a minute. This is the control that they exercised in the year 481. All right, so the Franks come in and they settle in the north part of Gaul and in 481 they have that much of a footprint. Now 481 is important because in 481 a character becomes a prince, a chieftain among the Franks whose name is Clovis, who you may have heard of, Clovis. And Clovis is important because he is the guy who, for the first time in Frankish history, is able to unite all of these disparate Frankish tribes under one crown. So he's credited, first of all, with being the first Frankish king who brings all the Franks together, in a sense, and in recognition of one authority. And so that's uh, the first thing that he did. He happened to be married, however, to a woman whose name was Clotilde, and Clotilde happened to be a Christian. She was not an Aryan Christian, she was an Orthodox Christian. Although she was surrounded in many uh, cases by Aryan types, she was nevertheless devoted to this classic Orthodox Christian faith. Through a political arrangement, she'd wound up married to Clovis, who was no Christian at all. He was a pagan, he was a warrior, and he was simply out to kind of build his empire and make his name great, you know, so that was the interesting relationship that they had. But nevertheless, Clotilde constantly was urging Clovis to recognize the God of the Christian faith, to have their children baptized, that kind of thing. Clovis would hear none of it. And so they had quite a tumultuous relationship, but it did leave an imprint in his thinking. And there was one occasion when Clovis was on the ropes in a battle. It's called the Battle of uh, Tobraic. It uh, took place in 496, and Clovis was getting the worst end of the deal. It didn't look good, and as sometimes happens, no atheists in foxholes, you know, that kind of situation. And Clovis, realizing things were going against him, thought, what have I got to lose, you know? And so this is a famous painting from about 1850 in which uh, a celebrated moment in which Clovis is crying out to his wife's God. Hey, if you're up there, you know, kind of deal. And uh, pleads for a victory and promises that if this Christian God will come and deliver Clovis and give him a victory in this battle, that Clovis promises, I'll become a Christian, you know, make your day. And so, uh, well, as it turns out, Clovis quite unexpectedly does have a startling victory in this battle. I'm going to leave the theology of this up to you. I'm just, I'm just reporting, you know, what happened here. It's a very famous incident, and Clovis, true to his word, Christmas Day of that same year, 496, is baptized and embraces the Christian faith. And we don't know the state of his heart. I don't know the state of his heart. I'm sure his wife was pleased that he made that move. If you look at the rest of his career, it might kind of make you wonder, you know, 
because he did continue his warring campaigns. He did continue to launch all kinds of uh, military expeditions against other parts of Gaul, gradually getting the entire region under his control so that by the end of his career in, four, in 511, you can see how much of Gaul he now controls. And so he was quite successful. Everywhere he went, he urged people, did I say urged? He urged people to become Christians. He would, you know, it was a great evangelistic technique. He said, you can be baptized one of two ways. You can either be baptized, the Trinitarian formula, and become a Christian, or we'll drown you. Which will it be, you know? <laughs> Amazingly, many people became Christians. It's just amazing. You know, he, he, had a, he had quite a compelling message there. Just people came forward, yeah, they'd convert, and so... So one of the great evangelists in church history and uh, lots and lots of folks came to faith, I guess. It is interesting, I mean, we look at this and we're just appalled that anybody in the name of Christian mission would do something like that, and, and rightly so. So I don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, or I'm not endorsing this. But it is interesting if you just study the history of the Frankish kingdom, how many, many people did in fact, over time, uh, really represent a true and legitimate expression of Christian faith. So even though the front door for them was a little bit uh, shaky, nevertheless, God works in mysterious ways, and this may be one of them. In any event, uh, Clovis was quite successful. So, so as I say, by the year 511, uh, this is the amount that he controlled. By the end of the era we're interested in, 600, uh, the Frankish kingdom had very, been very well established, and by that time, you would say that the Franks, though they certainly don't equal the Roman Empire, nevertheless represent the political power that was supportive of the church, and the church was for its part supportive of the Franks. So this is the beginning of what's called the Frankish era of church history, in which really you have the Frankish kingdom more or less working in concert with the church, and that is in many ways the overarching theme of this couple of hundred years. Clovis himself established a dynasty that's called the Merovingian dynasty in honor of his father. Now, any of you who uh, follow popular culture, you may have heard of the Merovingian dynasty because according to the Da Vinci Code, that's where, you know, the daughter of Jesus by Mary Magdalene showed up. That's all bogus, you understand that. But anyway, this is kind of where that little hook uh, shows up in terms of uh, the lore that has come down to us from various sources through history. But anyway, the Merovingians were this Frankish dynasty, and, and just to anticipate where this story goes briefly, it was uh, in the mid-600s that, uh, that Muhammad, he died in 632, and he established, of course, the Islamic faith in the latter part of, the, of his lifetime, so 620 to 630, and then there was just an explosion of growth, so that over the rest of that century, the seventh century, Islam spreads through Saudi Arabia, through the Holy Land, down into North Africa, across North Africa, up through Spain, and by the time you get to the early 700s, there's a strong and robust Islamic presence called the Moors there in Spain. And they are, they're wanting to push north, and in the year 732, there's a major conflict that takes place between the Merovingian dynasty, the successors of Clovis, and this uh, powerful military assault that's coming from Spain, pushing up into France. And that famous battle is called in the year 732. Somebody's got to know it. Where's Phil? Oh, Phil, you let me down. Phil always knows these things, you know. Have you ever heard of the Battle of Tours? Yeah, the Battle of Tours, 732, and the guy that, I'll, I'll cover this later, but it's just such a fun story, I'm going to give you the little kind of teaser right now. These are previews of, you know, features to come, but anyway, the, uh, the guy that is the champion in that battle, 732, is named, thank you, Charles Martel, which is a nickname, Charles the Hammer. He is the, what's called, mayor of the palace under the king which is something like saying the prime minister, but he was so powerful, so popular after this, he actually is elevated to the status of king 
And so a new dynasty is established called the Carolingian dynasty under by, by, uh, taking the name Charles. His grandson is the greatest Frankish king of all and his name is Charlemagne. There you go. So connect the dots a little bit. So that's why we like Clovis because Clovis is the guy who puts in place the forces that will eventually produce Charlemagne and Charlemagne is a very interesting character and we will indeed look at him uh, at a later time. So anyway, just, just to kind of plant that thought, we'll move on from there. The other story that I want to uh, uh, review with you this morning a little bit is the story of the Brits. So we have the Franks and the Brits, and it is especially in connection with the Brits, the British uh, population, that the, that the history of Gregory becomes important. Gregory himself was born into a family of some prestige in Rome, but born at a time, of course, when Rome itself was caught in the grips of all kinds of tumultuous upheaval. And this is when the barbarians are more or less dominating the world that surrounds Rome, and Rome herself is just kind of fighting for its life most of the time. Uh, nevertheless, there is a kind of continuity of government within the city, and they are constantly trying to maintain themselves as these barbarian forces are at war with each other and at war with Rome and others uh, through this time. So that's kind of the circumstance into which Gregory is born. He's a very bright young man, and the family that he is a member of has some political importance in the city, so that by the time Gregory is in his late 20s, he's shown such ability that he's actually installed into the position that was called the prefect of Rome, which might be something like being the secretary of state. He had some important diplomatic responsibilities. He was involved in trying to cut deals and negotiate terms with uh, you know, forces outside of Rome that were threatening to her. And so that was the role he was playing. He was a fairly young man uh, carrying on this particular responsibility with a high degree of competence and so on. And he earned quite a name for himself at that point. The high point of this part of his life was when he made a trip to the east and attempted to persuade the patriarch in Constantinople, who was the leader of the church in the east, to help out the beleaguered Christians and the Christian population in Rome, to send money, to send resources, even to send military assistance, something to help them out. And the patriarch in Constantinople said, not interested. And so at that point, Gregory probably had his first great disillusioning moment, realizing that what he thought could be a sort of political solution to the difficulties they were facing was just not going to happen. And he himself, assessing the situation, realized that his whole interest in politics may be misguided. And so somewhere along the line, probably around the year 575, when he's just about 35 years old, he abandons his position as a prefect and takes the position of a monk which would be kind of going to the other end of the political uh, the ladder of influence, you know. Puts on the simple garb. He had been dressed very well. He'd had all of these kinds of accoutrements of his political office. All of that is set aside. He sells all of it, gives it to the poor, which was kind of a common way of uh, changing course in this direction at that time. And so he takes the position of a monk and immediately begins to exercise his influence, such as it was, to help those in Rome who were so greatly distressed by the difficulties of the circumstances then. Now, there, was many, there were many poor people, many displaced people, people who had lost lands, people who were reduced to radical poverty, hunger, death, uh, you know, plague and so on, were just kind of ravaging the city and its environs. And, and Gregory really took this to heart and realized this was what he thought his real calling was. Not so much the high politics of the day, but more or less helping those who seemed to be so negatively affected by the harsh circumstances of the day. And so he really devotes himself in that way and, and became, again, quite a uh, respected character. He was so competent, so administratively gifted that he was able to engineer uh, very efficient delivery systems, you might say, in which people who had theretofore been in, in dire straits were all of a sudden able to uh, enjoy some degree of care by virtue of the church's uh, ability to provide it through an administrator like Gregory. And so he was once again more or less elevating himself, but now it was with a somewhat different focus. 
There's an interesting and quite uh, famous moment in the life of Gregory in which he had the opportunity to see some people who had been captured from the far north and brought down to be sold as slaves. The church by this time was officially, of course, opposed to slavery, but the barbarians surrounding Rome had no problem with it. And so they would, they would capture these folks in various kind of uh, uh, violent military clashes and bring them back and sell them as slaves off the auction block. And Gregory had heard that there were some folks, he'd never seen them before, who had come from the far north and who were going to be sold as slaves. And so he made his way to the slave market to see what they looked like, and he was stunned when he saw them. And uh, he looked at them because they were your typical Nordic types. He'd never seen the likes. Blonde hair, blue eyes, you know. And he looked at the person next to him and he said, what are these people called? And the person next to him, they're called angles. And of course, Gregory famously said, not angles, angels, you know. And then he said to the person standing next to him, are these people Christian? And the person said, no, no, they're, they're, they're druid, you know, they're given over to uh, uh, all kinds of superstition and paganism and so on. And, and Gregory was so sorry to hear that, that, uh, that people that in his estimation look so beautiful, as he said, uh, nevertheless were so given over to the darkness, you see, of the, of the uh, prince of this world. That was kind of his commentary. Then he said, uh, who's the king of these people? Well, the king at that time happened to be a guy by the name of Ale, A-L-L-E, and so that was the response given to which Gregory said, Ale, Alleluia, you know, and he took that as God's message to him that he, Gregory, was supposed to go to those people as a missionary, to bring them the good news of Christ, to bring them the benefits of the gospel, and so on. And so Gregory, from that time on, even though he continued his service, there in Rome and did his job very respectably, set his heart on the task of going and being a missionary to the Angles and their cousin uh, tribal groups, the Saxons, who were up there in Britain. He approached the Bishop of Rome at that time and pled with him for the authority to gather a small cadre of fellow monks and to go on this very perilous and dangerous uh, and what would some people would say ill-advised uh, effort to become missionaries up there in Britain to these characters, the Anglo-Saxons. Well, the Bishop of Rome said, no way, you know, we need you here, your services are invaluable to us, we're not going to send you off on some excursion to the far north, let other people do it, you stay here. But Gregory kept persisting and, and asking and so on until finally uh, the Bishop of Rome caved in. And so uh, Gregory was actually authorized with a small group of monks to go off as missionaries to the Angles and the Saxons there up in Britain. Well, he left town, was probably about 10 miles out of town when the people in Rome learned the decision that had been made and in one voice they came and just stormed the central sanctuary in Rome demanding that Gregory be brought back. No way was he going off you know, to be a missionary. They needed him too much here in Rome, and the bishop in Rome relented and sent someone off on horseback to recover uh, Gregory and bring him back. Gregory was heartbroken because he wanted so much to be a missionary under these circumstances. It didn't work out that way. So he stayed, but he never lost his interest in those strange people, the Anglo-Saxons, who were up there in the region of Britain. In the year 590, Gregory was uh, elevated to the position of what uh, the Catholic Church would call the Pope, the Papa, the Father, or the Bishop of the Church in Rome. Uh, he didn't want the job. He was uh, typical of people that prefer hands-on service, uh, not interested in this kind of bureaucratic post, but the, the, uh, the forces that were supporting him were so powerful that it really became impossible for him to resist their efforts, and so somewhat over his protest, nevertheless, he was elevated to that role in the year 590, and so that's why he's commonly called in Catholic history Pope Gregory, and uh, he is one of the line of the popes of the Catholic Church. Uh, he himself uh, regarded himself as the Bishop of Rome, and that was the uh, task, or that was the, the position that he held. Three little stories about Gregory that are interesting. One concerns his interactions with the dominant barbarian forces that were in Italy at that time called the Lombards and are under a character by the name of Ariulf, who was a bad guy, you know, and he'd been pillaging and 
and uh, destroying and looting the land, the environs around that region, and he was threatening Rome constantly. And it was, of course, uh, a source of great grief and uh, loss to the people who were there in Rome that this guy was out there more or less under control. Uh, Gregory had a, tried on, on various attempts, uh, various occasions to try to reach the man, to try to uh, reach some kind of understanding with him. Ariulf was uninterested in any of it until finally, famously, Gregory himself, dressed simply in the garb of a monk, uh, went out to meet him personally. No weapons, uh, no you know, military protection of any kind, no bodyguards, nothing. He just goes out all by himself to meet this man who has been responsible for untold death, bloodshed, violence, and so on. Gregory knew very well that this could be a very short trip, you know, and that it might be the uh, end of a career for him, but nevertheless felt that's what God was calling him to do. And so he went out and met with this barbarian chieftain who had been responsible for so many savage crimes during those days, and he met with him. And as the story goes, Ariolf was so touched by the dignity of the man, by the fearlessness of the man, by the kind of gravity of his presence, that Ariolf himself, though he didn't convert to the Christian faith, it didn't happen quite like that, nevertheless was so moved by it that he made a promise right there, which turned out to be a, a reliable promise, that he would never touch Rome, that he was, um, that he was so uh, impressed with Gregory himself and with the message that he bore that, uh, that he would mend his ways to some degree, not a lot, but at least that did uh, protect Rome uh, during those days from further uh, ravaging attacks by this character. Uh, another uh, little incident that took place with Gregory involves a monk named Augustine. This is not the Augustine that we studied earlier, uh, but this is a character who Gregory commissioned to go as a missionary to the Angles and the Saxons. He never lost his interest in them, and he wanted very much to have somebody go as a missionary to them, and this man was a man of demonstrated competence, but not very enthusiastic about the project. And so Gregory insisted, really kind of you know, pulling rank on him a little bit, and said, I want you to go and take a team with you and preach the gospel in Britain to these people, the Angles and the Saxons there, who are in that region. Uh, Augustine was uh, quite reticent, but, uh, but he was finally persuaded to do so, and he gathered a small group, and off they went. And all the way as they were traveling along northward through Gaul toward uh, the English Channel there and going to cross over into Britain, they were warned all along the way, don't do it. This is a suicide mission. You guys are never going to make it. Go home. You know, that was kind of the warning that they received all along the way, till finally Augustine himself decided, maybe this isn't such a smart plan, you know. And so he stops, he leaves his guys at a monastery under some degree of protection, rides all the way back to Rome to just check this one more time, you know, with Gregory. Uh, look, do you really understand what's going on here? All the warnings we've received, all these people say these Angles and Saxons are horrible. They're just violent. They're going to eat us for lunch. This is, you know, this is not going to be a pretty picture. Are you sure you want to waste our talents on these folks? Isn't there somewhere else we should be? And Gregory was insistent. You know, he, he had some deep sense that God wanted to reach those people. And so uh, Augustine was overruled once again by Gregory. And Gregory said to him, you know, words to the effect that if you die, it'll be to the glory of God. And if you live, it'll be to the glory of God. But you need to go and preach the gospel to those people in Britain. And so Augustine relents, goes back, and off they go into the heartland of Britain on a, what appeared to be an impossible mission, and they preach the gospel. And in one of the most astonishing reversals, unexpected reversals of expectation, these uh, Angles and Saxons in large numbers repented, turned, this was no threatening kind of, you know, become a Christian or die kind of thing. There was nothing like that. These people seemed to, in deep and heartfelt uh, uh, sincerity, turn to Christ. And there was a sweeping uh, kind of uh, uh, interest and conversion of many of them. I, I won't say a multi, I won't say, uh, let's say a majority, but certainly a vast number of them, including their leaders, turned to faith in Christ. And immediately, of course, the culture of the Angles and the Saxons changed. This all is taking place around the year 600. And as a result of that, Britain becomes largely, uh, comes largely under the influence of the Christian faith, 
for decades to come. And really, it's rather, a, a, you know, relatively speaking, a quiet time in British history. There's certainly war and conflict and so on, but nothing like it had been until Britain itself is attacked by another Nordic group who looked a lot like the Angles and the Saxons, who were called the Vikings, and they come in in the early 800s. And the greatest king of the Anglo-Saxon uh, time in England is the one who, of course, meets the Vikings. And his name was Alfred the Great. And so we'll be looking at Alfred the Great a little bit later as well. But uh, again, I'm just trying to connect a few dots here. So you have Augustine, who, by the way, became the first Archbishop of Canterbury and uh, stayed on his entire career there, has a very remarkably successful, by the grace of God, uh, ministry there in that region, and establishes a long-term Christian ministry that continued for years, indeed centuries into the future, uh, even though at the time it seemed like an impossible task. The last little anecdote I'd like to mention about uh, 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 Gregory is somewhat ironic because during his rule as the Bishop of Rome, he heard that the patriarch in Constantinople had declared himself to be the universal leader of the Christian church in the world. So this is the Bishop of Rome. Here's that the Patriarch of Constantinople has claimed to be the authority over the entire Christian church. And Gregory went apoplectic and said that there is no such position. There is no such, this is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because he is a pope. He said there, and in fact, this was the point where famously a little phrase that's been associated with the papal office was developed. And Gregory himself is the first one, as far as we know, who said it. He said, my task is not to be this great elevated authority over the church, but the servant of the servants of God, you know. And that's the way he saw himself, and that's really the way he conducted himself throughout his career. And so he really did establish a paradigm for governance of the church and leadership in the church that, in my mind, is very much like what Paul is describing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and very much like what Jesus himself describes when he's dealing with ideas of leadership and greatness in the kingdom, and he says, he who would be great among you, let him be the servant of all. You sometimes hear the expression in culture, upward mobility, but of course, as Christian people, we're in, interested in downward mobility. We're interested in washing feet. We're interested in being servants. And what's interesting to me about this character, Gregory, is even when he had great authority, he used that authority that still was in the spirit of being a servant. It sounds to me a little bit like Paul's own admonition to the Corinthians. They were so pompous, so elevated, so conceited in this kind of egotistical uh, fascination with these leaders in the church, not appreciating that what those leaders were actually demonstrating was this servant leadership that gets down on the knees and is a servant to those that God may bring across our path. My Sunday school lesson, I hope, is uh, predictable at this point. Every one of us in this room has authority, just like Gregory. Maybe not as much authority, maybe not the same kind of authority, but every one of us have gifts. Every one of us has influence. Every one of us has those who are watching us and in some ways measuring the cadence of their own lives by what we do and what we say. And there's always two paths to walk for anybody that has authority, and that is, do I use this authority, this, these gifts, these benefits that have been trusted to me for my good, or do I use them for the benefit of those that God brings into my life? And I think I can hazard to say that every one of us in this room will have someone in our life today and tomorrow and the next day, and we face a little crossroads with each one. If you're a parent to a child, Parents are, in many deep ways, the servants of their children. You are serving a child to rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That doesn't mean you lose your parental authority. Heaven forbid, it means that you use that authority, however, for their good. I've told my students at uh, school occasionally, you know, sometimes it kind of catches them by surprise. I am here as your servant. I am your servant. They, they tend to view the teacher as the authority and the leader and the dictatorial, iron-fisted guy that always... 
No, 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 I'm here as your servant. I'm here as your servant this morning. We are here as each other's servants, aren't we? Because that's what the nature of Christian leadership is. So I like Gregory because I think he, of uh, many of those who have populated the history of the church, really bears out the uh, uh, character of that approach to leadership in a way that is worthy of our study and emulation. Thank you.